Okay, can we uh, should, maybe we should start? It's it's five oh one, and I and I want to start. Welcome to um, the Doctoral College inaugural lectures. This is the real showcase of Exmoor um, University Letters PhD students. This is the kind of thing I really enjoy hosting the most. We do one for each college. Um, we've got two lectures for you today. Um, just to give you a, bit, a little bit of context, you know, why am I here? Because I kind of kind of know these guys, and maybe I'm, maybe they're part of my family. But these lectures and the lecturers were selected from a fairly large pool of potentials. So to get into the pool to have a chance of presenting all these lectures is pretty good. And then to get beyond that, to get past the bar um, to actually give the lecture, you really have to be the best of the best. So tonight we've got two really fantastic lectures for you um, by two fantastic lecturers. We've limited them to about half an hour. Um, and there's a bit of time for you to ask a few questions at the end, um, and a bit of networking outside, and a few University of Leicester famous nibbles to keep you uh, keep you here. <laughs> but there are lots of hostelries that are, that are good to stay. So if you want to go on afterwards, go and see the largest. So our first lecturer today is Nikesh Gatani, and Nikesh is going to talk to us about is having diabetes a good thing. I think that, that, that surely must. Um, keep you interested in that. So, Nikesh, could you please give us your doctoral yeah. inaugural lecture? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prof. So, thanks very much for the opportunity to talk to you about my research. Um, can having diabetes be a good thing, the role of glucose transporters in abdominal aortic aneurysms? So the um, abdominal aorta, uh, the aorta is the largest blood vessel in the body. And um, the abdominal aorta is prone to expansion. And when it reaches the size of around three centimetres in diameter, we tend to call this an aneurysm. Um, and we often abbreviate this to AAA, abdominal aortic aneurysm. What is the problem with AAA? Well, as the aorta expands, uh, it can lead to rupture. And unfortunately, rupture is usually fatal in around 75% of cases. And while the aorta is expanding, there's usually no symptoms. So often these patients present very late and in a really, really bad way. And in England and Wales, uh, AAA rupture accounts for around 5,500 deaths each year. Does everybody know who this is? Yeah. So Albert Einstein famously uh, died of an abdomin abdominal aortic aneurysm rupture, uh, and he was uh, on his way to the hospital and actually declined to have it operated. So he, he died very peacefully, um, but it, you know, as it, say, it does affect many people that we know. How do we treat it? Well, the treatment is always surgical. Uh, there's two main types. Um, the first that you can see on the left of the slide is the open surgical repair, and that's the traditional way of repairing an aneurysm. We basically stitch in a plastic graft in lieu of the aneurysm and divert the blood away from the aneurysm sac. On the right is a new keyhole, sexier operation, small cuts, um, and you can see what we basically do is place a covered stent inside the aneurysm, but we leave the aneurysm sac there untouched. The problem with both of these operations is that they're only licensed, if you like, for aneurysms that reach five and a half centimetres in diameter. In the UK, we've recently introduced a national aneurysm screening program. And you can see here a typical flyer from NHS Scotland, um, basically inviting men aged 65 for a quick and cheap, easy, painless scan of their abdominal aorta. And you basically get a picture, something like this, and you measure the size of the abdominal aorta in the AP plane, in the anteroposterior plane. And any abdominal aorta more than three centimetres in size is basically enrolled into a surveillance programme and we follow these patients up and the premise is that if you can detect these aneurysms early then you can offer people an operation prior to the aneurysm rupturing. The problem with the screening programme is that it detects a lot of small aneurysms so aneurysms that are not suitable for surgical repair but from a clinical standpoint this gives us a, a window of opportunity in which to slow aneurysm growth potentially. And this is really the focus of my research. So what we did is we looked at the risk factors for abdominal aortic aneurysms. 
you can see here male sex, increasing age, uh, having high blood pressure or smoking all increase your aneurysm growth rate. And on the flip side, being of female sex from the Asian subcontinent or having diabetes actually is associated with a reduced aneurysm growth rate. And it's this interesting relationship between diabetes and abdominal aneurysms that has been the focus of my research. And it sort of intrigued me because diabetes, as many of you will know, is a very strong cardiovascular risk factor. So why does it protect you against having abdominal aortic aneurysm? A little bit about diabetes or diabetes mellitus. It's a, it's a condition characterized by high blood glucose levels. And we all produce a hormone called insulin, and that lowers blood sugar. And there's two types of diabetes. Type 1, where you produce no insulin, or type 2, where you produce insulin, but it doesn't work. And as a result, you have a syndrome of insulin resistance. Type 2 is on the rise, both globally uh, as well as in, this UK, in, in the UK, and it's largely driven by this obesity epidemic that we all hear about on the news. What's this relationship between diabetes and abdominal aortic aneurysms? Well, diabetes is associated um, with a reduced number, a reduced growth rate, and also a reduced rupture rate of abdominal aortic aneurysms. But the mechanisms are largely unknown. So the aim of, this, um, of my thesis, if you like, was to quantify the effect of diabetes on abdominal aortic aneurysm prevalence. And secondly, to investigate the biological basis for this relationship. So we'll talk about the first aim. We talk about quantifying something. We are probably all familiar with this, um, with this pyramid of evidence, this hierarchy of evidence. And as you can see at the top of that, that pyramid, meta-analyses is gives you the highest level of evidence, and this is what I wanted to try and do for this relationship. Uh, what we did is we did a literature search using the standard medical databases, so Medline, PubMed, and used these terms to try and identify studies that um, gave some information on the prevalence of aneurysms in patients with and without diabetes. And what we used is a, a sort of established a program that Cochrane um, Laboratory used, Review Manager, to... Um, get some information on prevalence and incidence of this disease in the presence of diabetes. So I won't go and bore you with all the forest plots, but there were a lot of them. But really the headline figures, when we did an analysis looking for studies looking at prevalence, and this is an analysis did on around 4.5 million patients, um, there was a 20% lower prevalence of abdominal aortic aneurysms in the presence of diabetes. When we looked at those studies pertaining to incidence of um, aneurysms, we found that there was a 60% lower incidence of aneurysms. And the difference is obviously prevalence is the, the, the number of aneurysms in the, in the population at any one time, whereas incidence is those new aneurysms coming through. And when we combined the data for prevalence and aneurysms, we found a 50% lower rate of combined prevalence and, and, and incidence of abdominal aneurysms in the presence of diabetes. And that's an analysis of around 7 million patients. The question is why? So, the, so the, the epidemiological relationship is very robust. Our hypothesis was that really the protective effect of diabetes on AAA is merely but a favourable complication, if you like. And therefore, those mechanisms that regulate the unfavourable complications, the ones we all hear about, the diabetic eye disease, the diabetic kidney disease, may be playing a role here. To this end, we looked at this family of proteins called the glucose transporters, and some of you may be familiar with these. They're a family of 14 transmembrane proteins. Um, they facilitate the transport of glucose across plasma cell membranes, and they're present in all mammalian cells. And this schematic basically shows what they do. So why look at glucose transporters, or GLUTs, as we commonly abbreviate that to, uh, in the context of AAA and diabetes? Well... They have been implicated in the development of diabetic kidney disease and diabetic eye disease. They've recently been characterised in the abdominal aorta only in 2012. Mutations in one of these proteins is associated with something called arterial tortuosity syndrome, which is characterised by aneurysm formation. And one of these proteins does co-localise with something called LRP1, uh, which is a, a protein that was uh, discovered... Um, involved in atherosclerosis, but mutations in this protein do, uh, do predispose to aneurysm formation. That was found in Leicester. So the hypothesis of this 
next aim of the study was that the expression or the activity of these proteins is increased in the presence of AAA. And that diabetes either reduces this expression or reduces its activity and thereby giving a plausible mechanism by why they might be involved. We employed a two-phase study to look at this. The first phase was trying to answer the first hypothesis. So what we did is we took whole aortic tissue from patients undergoing open surgical repair of their aneurysm uh, and also used cadaveric control, basically patients who um, had donated their organs for um, kidney transplantation. We took, we took those as a, as a control tissue. And what we did is we tried to look at both the mRNA level, the protein level, and the activity of these, of these, prote of these glucose transporters. And we also cultured aortic smooth muscle cells from this whole aortic tissue and did the same in, in, that, in that cell type. Phase two, we took those aortic smooth muscle cells and exposed them to either a normal glucose level or a high glucose level. And basically, you had to look to see what does that do to your expression of glucose transporters or the activity of these proteins. So, you know, I, I think some of you may be from di other disciplines. So, you know, we just, the central dogma of biology when we talk about RNAs and proteins is that we have DNA inside a cell. And this is, if you like, the code. And this codes uh, an mRNA single-stranded molecule. Uh, and then that codes a protein. So if you like the DNA, it determines what proteins are made. And, and th this, is, this is basically, we're looking at the second and third uh, tiers of that, of that dogma. So the methodology. Um, try to keep this as straightforward as possible, but excuse the slight complexity of it. So we took the whole aortic tissue. And what we did is we cultured these aortic smooth muscle cells. We also performed immunohistochemistry with this tissue to look at the whole uh, protein expression. And then we homogenized this using a uh, special bead homogenizer to uh, extract total RNA. We also extracted total RNA from the smooth muscle cells. And we then performed something called a glucose transport assay, um, where we use radio-labeled glucose to determine what the activity of these glucose transporters was. And then we use that total RNA as well to determine the mRNA expression. Finally, for phase two, we took those aortic smooth muscle cells, exposed them to varying levels of glucose, and tried to determine what is the mRNA expression and what is the activity of these proteins. So come on to the, um, the results from phase one. And so when we looked at the whole aortic tissue, we found we, we looked at a number of glucose transporters, but I'm just going to present here some of the positive results, really. We found that the expression of GLUT3 and GLUT6 was significantly higher in the whole aortic tissue from patients with aneurysms. And then when we looked at protein expression, as I mentioned, we'd performed immunohistochemistry and a little bit about the methodology. We basically fixed the tissue and stained for six glucose transporters. We then produced a, a picture like you see in the top right, and we split that, that histological slide into five different zones based on which part of the aortic wall it was, so the intima, the media, the adventitial, the boundary zones. And two independent observers then graded the level of brown staining for, on a scale of zero to three. And we summated those scores uh, and then gave a sort of total expression score for each slide. So again, I'm just going to present some of the headline data. What we found in the uh, whole aortic tissue, from patients with... Um, Abdominal aortic aneurysm, there was a significantly higher rate of both GLUT1, GLUT3, and GLUT6. And this is just some of the representative slides, as you can see. And the, the, the slides, the six pictures on the left, are those from uh, patients with abdominal aortic aneurysm, and the six slides on the right are those from control tissues. And these are just representative images, but I hope you can see that some of the brown staining, particularly in those glucose transporters 1, 3, and 6 do look to be more in, in, the, in the aneurysmal tissues. So this is, again, a slightly busy slide, but essentially when we looked at to see in the aortic smooth muscle cells what was the mRNA expression between aneurysms and controls, we found no s difference. But what we did find in the aortic smooth muscle cells was that the activity of these proteins was significantly higher in the aortic smooth muscle cells from patients with aneurysms. So aneurysmal smooth muscle cells seem to be using more glucose than their control counterparts. 
So in summary, what we found at phase one is that abdominal aortic aneurysm is associated with the increased expression of GLUT3 and GLUT6 mRNA, GLUT1, GLUT3 and GLUT6 proteins, and an increased GLUT activity, aortic smooth muscle cell glucose transporter activity in those tissues from aneurysm patients. Looking at phase two, so this was to try and answer the second hypothesis um, that diabetes will reduce the expression and or activity of these proteins. So what we did is we took those aortic smooth muscle cells and exposed them to four different levels of glucose. The first three, as you can see, were all glucose concentrations within the physiological range. And we also exposed them to a superphysiological glucose level of 50 millimoles of glucose. And we wanted to see what's the effect on expression and activity. So this is the slide for expression, and it's a very busy slide, but essentially none of the protein, none of the glucose transporters that we looked at um, were significantly altered by exposure to high glucose. But as you can see, there's you know, a limited number of, of uh, patients that we, that we could um, grow cells from. However, for the glucose transporter activity, we were able to grow more cells. And what we found is certainly within the physiological range, and I'll draw your attention to the, the red bars over the blue bars, when we look at those within the physiological range, you can see that there was a, a stepwise decrease in the glucose transporter activity as we expose these cells to increasing levels of hyperglycemia. And if you compare 25 millimoles versus 4.6, which is a normal glucose level, you can see that it was around a 30% decrease in the glucose transporter activity. So this was very interesting. But we wanted to see, was this just because there was more sugar molecules in the solution that we were exposing these cells to? Was this, was this an osmotic effect? So we exposed those cells also to something called mannitol, which is like a control. And we found that that wasn't the case. So it, it was an effect limited to hyperglycemia. You can see here that the pink line does decrease with increase in glucose levels, whereas the orange line is, tends to be a relatively horizontal. And finally, we wanted to see, we wanted to try and validate our findings in another model. So what we tried to do is take normal aortic smooth muscle cells, um, so these are cell lines, uh, and we tried to turn them into an aneurysm type cell. So what we did is we used something called a small hairpin RNA, and this is like a sort of hack, if you like. It's trying to hack the the genome. And what we did is we, we basically transfected a carrier cell to produce these viruses that would reduce the expression of something called LRP1. And if you, if you remember, I mentioned that LRP1 is mutations in LRP1 are associated with aneurysm development. So what we did is we managed to reduce the expression of LRP1 in normal aortic smooth muscle cells. And consequently, this increased the level of matrix metallonoproteinases, which is a, an enzyme that degrades the, the aortic wall. So these cells, after infection, became like an aneurysm type cell. And then what we did is we did, ran the same experiments looking at glucose transporter activity. And again, what you can see here is that normal glucose level, when you knock out this, or when you knock down LRP1, there is this significant increase in the rate of glucose utilized by the cell. But when you expose those cells to high sugar, so 25 millimoles of glucose, there's, a, there's, a, there's much less of an increase. And actually, you can see here that hyperglycemia did reduce the glucose activ activity selectively in those cells that had LRP1 knocked down. So this was, again, validated our findings from the, the patient samples. So what we found, if you like, in, in summary, high glucose does not alter the mRNA expression of glucose transporters, but it does seem to decrease the activity of these proteins selectively in the cells from AAA patients. So if you like, in conclusion, we found that glucose transporter expression is higher in the AAA tissue. These cells tend to transport more glucose at, at baseline, and that diabetes was able to reduce this level of glucose transport. And this may explain the protective effect of diabetes on abdominal aortic aneurysms. What's the future potential of this research? Well, the title of the talk was, <laughs> is having diabetes a good thing? Clearly, we're not recommending that everyone become diabetic. But understanding this relationship is important, and it may lead to the um, use of glucose transporter inhibitors that could 
act as a novel pharmacological means of slowing aneurysm expansion. So I'd just like to thank um, both my supervisors, all my collaborators, as well as um, my family for supporting me with this research, and the Circulation Foundation, who actually generously gave me a lot of money to perform this. So thank you very much. Sure. Both, yes. I just, I, 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 we did, yes. And actually, when you do this, your search engine will automatically do that for you as well. Yes. We, we didn't look at that, unfortunately, no. We did, look, we did do some more cellular work that, that I've um, demonstrated here. So we did look at protein expression in cells, um, but we didn't look at specifically cell surface receptors. So that's maybe something we can do later on. Okay, I've got a couple of questions. Mm. One is in relation to cholesterol. Sure. Where there's any kind of way in any... Uh, there's links to the amount of cholesterol that's deposited in the yeah. vessel wall. And secondly, I, I, I know it's not the kind of area that you've been personally involved with, but has anybody looked at the biomechanical problem in terms of the, the elasticity? Mm. You can measure, you know, because people at Royal London do a lot of work in that field. That was aware of a few years ago. Yeah. So um, with regards to your first question, so cholesterol, um, there's been lots and lots of studies looking at the effect of statins on aneurysm and growth. And actually, it doesn't seem to reduce your rate of aneurysm growth when you look at randomised controlled trials. So although in small animal models, they do seem to have a, a beneficial effect. When you look at large population data and when you randomise patients to statin or no statin, you don't get an effect. So this is the reason that we're still treating this, this disease with an operation. We haven't yet found a pill. With regards to your second question, there is, um, there is some research in mesangial cells. So when we look at um, as I mentioned, a lot of this work looking at glucose transporters happen in the kidney. And when they look at mesangial cell stretch, this does lead to increase uh, glucose transporter use, about 40% upregulation. So that's probably another, another reason why aneurysm type cells utilize more glucose as well. So that would be, a, you know, that's another future avenue that we could take that forward. So follow up on the next one. Is there a difference between controlled and uncontrolled diabetes? Is it, is it like heart rate variability, mm. is it blood glucose variability that's important? It is. Um, so both the, it's more to do not just with one-off high blood sugars, but it's the chronicity, if you like. So at one, one or two high blood sugar levels, we often see in our patients, and that's fine. In fact, we, we would like them not to be too low. Um, but over a long period of time, that chronically high sugar has a number of reasons why it can damage your, your macro and microvasculature. So it can cause cross-linking between proteins. Um, it can um, basically calcify the vessel. So it actually reduces, if you like, the ability of the, the vessel to transmit the pulse wave down the vessel. And um, it will increase the oxidative stress within the, within the tissue as well, and that will have some damaging effects. Um, with regards to complicated and uncomplicated, we tend to define that by whether or not you develop one of those complications I met. So uncomplicated diabetes is, if you like, somebody with a very high blood sugars, but they haven't yet developed nephropathy or retinopathy or uh, what we tend to see is neuropathy with a foot ulcer, and these patients often lose their legs as their first presentation. Okay, so uh, we're out of time for questions. So, so Nikesh won the um, Lauder Prize for MD students, and Professor Lauder is in the, the audience with us, and I wonder if you would be so kind as to present the, uh, the prize and the medal in your name to, right. to the winner. Okay, well, that was absolutely brilliant. Uh, going back to when the medical school was founded in 1975, it had the great presence of mind to appoint, um, it became Sir Peter Bell, eventually, Professor yes. Sir Peter Bell, as the foundation professor of surgery.
And he has, if I can use the word fathered, but he's fathered generation after generation of really talented academic vascular surgeons. And I think we've seen another one here this afternoon. Um, the closest contact I normally have with vascular surgeons now is I bump into Rob Says ask, uh, walking his two dogs out on the left of the countryside. But it's a pleasure to hear what he had to say tonight. And it's a great pleasure to present you with um, the certificate and the prize for what was a really good piece of research. Well done. Thank you very much.